Hey everyone, welcome to week 30, the big 3-0. Uh, that means we have done over 150 videos and we think that that's pretty amazing. But remember, this is a two-year project, so we still have a ways to go. But um, thank you for everyone that has been uh, supporting us through just watching these videos or um, buying a painting in our storefront. You know, that's the way we uh, keep the lights on. So thank you, thank you very, very much. But this is week 30, day one. This is Monday. And the theme for this week is going to be uh, drawing in painting. So what is the role of drawing in my painting practice? And we're going to try to define it differently every day of the week. So let's see how that goes. Again, 30 weeks. Thank you. You guys have been amazing. Okay, let's get started. Now for this week's theme, I thought I would talk about something that um, really interests me. And in ways that I never intended, it's almost like an element that has helped people recognize what I do. In broader terms, what we're going to speak about this week is uh, drawing in painting. What that means is that we're going to explore the role of drawing in the painting process, within the painting process. This is not drawing in painting, as in the whole of painting. No, this is drawing in my painting. I always have to specify that this is my path. And this is not me avoiding to take responsibility for trying to make remarks about drawing. No, this is just me trying to clarify that this is how I've understood drawing, the value of drawing within my path, and how relevant it is to my painting. This can be vastly different from your understanding of what drawing means to you within your painting practice. So I always have to remind people that what I'm trying to do with this exercise is, yes, perhaps talk about things that other people may find echo their practices, but in reality, I can only speak from what I do and from how my experiences have shaped my own painting practice. So bear that in mind when I say things. I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I'm not trying to dismiss any other characteristics or aspects that drawing may have for other people. I'm just saying that this is how I've come to understand the relevance of drawing within my painting. I think that that's very important to understand. So within my painting, I think drawing actually plays a really kind of interesting role. Because when I started painting, I saw it as something that would just enable me to paint. I think I associated drawing as a specific moment during the execution of a painting. Uh, what that means is that it occupied a very, very particular space. So initially, you would try to solve your drawing through compositional sketches and studies. And eventually, you were able to solve through drawing the idea that you wanted to express. And then you translated that idea from your sketches or your sketchbook or your pad onto a usually larger board or canvas. If it was a canvas, you could either project it or grid it. I would usually grid my more complex compositions. That's the moment where you would check that box of drawing and say, I'm kind of done with my drawing. I've already worked everything out that has to do with drawing, which in my case, it mostly has to do with composition and design. So once I had worked that out, I could concentrate on the aspects that were inherent to painting. So it may be that in that drawing, not unlike the Norman Rockwell process, I would also think of what was going on in terms of value. I didn't even have to worry about that while I was painting. My values were already ticked off also. So when you get to painting, all you're thinking about is the aspects that are inherent to painting. So you would think about hues and saturation and temperature and uh, about the physicality of paint, where you want paint to be thinner, where you want paint to be thicker. It was almost like putting your mind at rest and you would be able to say, okay, I've already worked really, really hard at doing all the heavy lifting through the drawing in those initial stages. Now I can just relax and concentrate on painting 
but I always have to be mindful and respectful of my drawing. That is also key. That's very, very important. You wouldn't work super, super hard at the beginning. You wouldn't try to solve all these problems and then bulldozer your way over them because that wouldn't make sense. Why would you spend all that time and energy then in the first place? In that painting process, the role of drawing is very, very important. You can't construct a good painting over a bad drawing. You know, you can only do a good painting over a good drawing. A good drawing would be a clue of how your painting was going to go. And it is true, sometimes you could be a fantastic draftsman, like we talked in weeks past about uh, Proudhon, about the French uh, neoclassicist. He was a terrific draftsman, as good as you could be. But he was a sucky painter. That's just the truth. I'm sorry, but that's objectively true. <laughs> so yeah, it could happen that you could have a very strong drawing and then just not be able to understand fully painting in order to squeeze all that energy that you have in your drawing. But usually they both go hand in hand. A terrific painter was usually a very, very capable draftsman. So in essence, we can understand how those two moments are just absolutely linked. Now the thing is, remember, my process of painting was also accompanied by a process of illustration. And the illustrator part of me was also very, very conscious of American 1960s and 70s illustration where some of the most ridiculously talented draftsmen were part of that industry. I don't know what it was about the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, but drawing was just an integral part of communicating. And you got people like Robert Fawcett and Al Parker, Austin Briggs, Bob Peak, Robert Weaver, uh, Bernie Fuchs, just people that used drawing as a tool to communicate. And when you look at those illustrations, even though many, many times they would end up being paintings, you could sense that what was holding that painting together was drawing. I mean, there was no doubt in your mind that that was its role. Its role was just to be the underlying structure of the image, but it wasn't just the armature onto which painting was going to be constructed. No, it was there, it was present, it was visible, it was evident. Drawing was not really part of a process that finished in painting. In traditional painting, drawing was just a means to get to painting, where you sort of invoked drawing to be able to have clarity on a ton of things that you were trying to resolve. But in this latter half of the 20th century, drawing was just visible, it was powerful, it was so, so strong that it just felt different. It wasn't part of a process. It wasn't just a technique. It wasn't a moment. So here I am trying to marry these two seemingly opposing characters of drawing. Because on the one hand, it is an initial part of a process that finishes in painting. And on the other hand, it is an expressive tool that can show up in your finished piece. So how do you come to terms with those two definitions. And I think that that struggle was actually fantastic for me because it opened up my mind. And I think that the purpose of just questioning the role of drawing was not just to come up with a solution. It, my role as a young artist was not to say, okay, you know, this is like a seesaw. What side do I want to pick? Do I want to pick the side where that finished painting is what's important to me? Or do I want to pick the side where my drawing is going to show up in that final image? It's going to be superficially visible in my final image. No, it wasn't either or. It wasn't binary. Some people do believe in those things and, and, and believe that there's an inherent philosophy to either one of those two types of images. I don't. I think that what art history, painting history, drawing history is almost asking of us is that we reflect upon all the good things that are there and to say, would this be useful to what I want to say? Would this manner of working be congruous with my intent? And I think that that is the most important part. And when you do that, when you understand a technique, not just as a mere technique that almost justifies itself, but as something that can empower your voice, as something that can enrich your intent, then 
you know, you start to understand how those aspects can be magnified while you're working. To me, here comes the cool part. It was like a, a small act of rebellion to say, well, maybe drawing doesn't have to you know, occupy a certain moment during the image making process. Maybe it doesn't have to be at the beginning and maybe it doesn't mean that I have to preserve it until the end and respect and be able to showcase the mark making at the end. Um, maybe it doesn't have to be either one of those. Maybe it can be both. You know, what happens if I start with a drawing, then I cover it up with my painting, then I draw again, then I cover it up again, then I draw again. So drawing was almost like this mutating thing. It showed up to clarify things, then I sort of covered it up with paint to try and follow that path. And what would happen if I got lost? Well, you know, I invoked drawing once again to help me find my way once again. And then I cover it up. And if I felt I lost some strength, then I call on it again. And that's it. And that to me was just amazing. I would like to say that this is something that I understood because I saw it first in other people. And if that was the case, I would have no issue in being 100% honest with you guys and saying, yeah, the thing is I looked at uh, Giacometti and I saw the way he would paint, draw, paint, draw, paint, draw, paint, draw, paint, draw, almost incessantly, indefinitely in an image. And I fell in love with that. And the truth is, I didn't. I wasn't aware of Uglo or Coldstream or Antonio Lopez. I wasn't aware of what uh, Degas was doing with his drawing marks. I wasn't. The truth is, and I'm so respectful of, of what it means within my painting, even though I don't want it to become a shorthand. I'm very aware of that too, but I'm, I'm so grateful to that response that I gave because I needed it, because I actually was looking for it while I was painting. I wasn't searching for anything superficial. I wasn't saying, oh, I'm trying to look for a style of painting and this can look like a good style. I, I was never, ever, ever interested in that. What I was interested in while I was painting was finding my way. That's all it was. It was just finding my way. And this is one of a myriad of ways that we can find our way. You know, there's tons of ways to find our way. Sometimes it's re-blocking in a painting, which I love to do, re-establishing a painting. Sometimes you just re-establish your darks just so that you have contrast once again. You were probably working within midtones and you lost that value range that you had at the beginning with, let's say, like an umber underpainting. During my career, I think I've gone through tons of different paths where I've used this abstract sense of drawing to try and reestablish ideas within my paintings. But they don't always have to do with this thin mark making that we associate with our drawing tools like a pencil or a charcoal or a lining brush like I use. Even the name lining brush inherently speaks about making line work and line work we associate with drawing. So I think I landed on making marks with a lining brush just because it almost put me in a mindset where I told myself, I have to have clarity about this and I have to explore like the smallness of form again. You know, I was speaking about broadness when I blocked in and I tried to advance. Maybe I got lost. Let me see if I can have like a sharper tool, a finer tool that can put me back on track. And that's why I used that tool. I had never used a lining brush. I don't think I even have the hand to properly use a lining brush or a rigger brush well. But the thing is, I just gravitated towards it because I needed it. That's the thing. I just felt I needed drawing at those moments in my painting where I was getting lost. Now today, and I think this is gonna be cool, I thought that we could emphasize different aspects of painting. And I can actually let you guys know which of those aspects I think is present in these paintings that I'm doing. For today's painting, I think it's very, very cool because, you know, it's almost like a ridiculous painting. And even Fed posing there, she actually understands that this is a ridiculous painting. So what it is, is just that I had some paintings delivered and they had a bunch of these plastic strips that are used to secure packages. And I cut them all off and they just felt like this wonderful bouquet of chaos. And I asked Fer to hold them 
And it looked so weird that I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to take a picture. And I don't even know if I'm going to paint this or draw this. I don't care. But this is, this is just so unorganized and so just whatever that I was like, yeah, this is perfect. And I thought, yes, I could use this image as a reflection and drawing for this first exercise for today's painting because... And this is the first aspect of drawing that we are going to focus in on this week, which is drawing as reminder. And what I mean by that is just that the chaotic nature of what I was looking was something that I felt immediately. I felt that this was a knot. But I think that when you're painting a knot, you can't paint an organized knot. It would be ridiculous to just try to impose order into all this chaos. The role of drawing in this case was not trying to make sense of this knot. It, it wasn't. This was, again, just tangled chaos, and I wanted to preserve that nature. If that's what moved me in the beginning, why not just preserve it? Why not just keep it? If you saw me in my drawing, I was a little bit hesitant. I think I was a bit of a coward at first, just trying to like softly block in Fer's portrait. And then when I got to all these strips, then I felt I had enough courage to just really press down with my color pencil. I, I don't know why when we draw portraits or when we draw something that we consider to be more sensitive, it's almost like we change gears and we adjust our drawing in my mind, we shouldn't do that. Drawing should be like one thing and one thing that envelops everything. I have to admit, I kind of lacked the courage to be bold at the beginning with her portrait. But then, you know, as I gained momentum, I was like, oh yeah, now I'm making all these like, you know, very, very expressive marks for this jumbled mess that were all these uh, strips of plastic. So as I was painting, I realized, well, there is no roadmap here. There's no instructions that I can follow because this is a mess, you know, and I want to preserve that mess. And I can't draw a mess and then carefully paint it. That would also be insane. That would be ridiculous. The reason I'm calling it drawing as a reminder is that the essence of what I'm trying to paint is there. Drawing is serving me as a moment during the uh, making of the picture that reminds me this has this nature. Don't let it go. Don't sacrifice it. This is what moved you when you were looking at it hold on to this and don't solve it in an orderly fashion. And that's kind of what I tried to do during the painting. I was, yes, trying to be bold and sensitive with Ferris' portrait. The way I eventually found my way through it was by scraping it and then putting tiny little notes of drawing on top, which actually felt really, really nice because I thought I was overdoing it. So... I've never had an issue with just scraping something out and then starting all over again. You guys have seen me do that. I love to do that if I feel that I'm lost. And then for the bottom part of the painting, I just, you know, I just kept the abstract qualities of it because in the end, who cares what she's holding? Nobody has to know or try to understand or rationalize what she's holding. It doesn't matter. Even her expression is that of, oh my God, my dad is making me pose with these stupid things. There's no rhyme or reason for any of this. This is dumb, but he's asking me to do it. I'll do it. He's probably going to do a painting and he's going to feel that it's awesome. My dad's an idiot. I'll do it for him. That's pretty much, you know, the way my uh, kids' brains uh, work when I ask them to pose. So why would I try to make sense of it as if this was an allegory of some kind or as if there was sense to all of this? No, no. I just thought it was really nice that she was trying to contain this huge mess. Drawing as reminder. I think that that is an incredibly powerful aspect of drawing. It is there just to kind of nudge us on the shoulder and say, hey, remember the inherent qualities of the thing that you were moved by and try to keep those alive while you're painting. That was very, very important for me. And I think that that's an invaluable quality of drawing. It may not show up in the final painting. It, it doesn't matter. There's no rules to this. Uh, if it shows up, fine. There are tiny little moments where that initial drawing kind of shows through. And there are moments where, let's call it the uh, second instance of drawing, which is when I call upon drawing once again to give me a little bit of clarity, which is kind of amazing because drawing was reminding me to keep a chaotic nature within the whole piece, but it also gives me a sense of clarity when I can hit something and say, okay, her eyelashes are this little gesture. 
And if I hit it right, and if it's in the right spot, oh my God, then drawing is bliss. But today we were concentrating on drawing as reminder. That's very cool and it's very evident in this painting. So these are just different aspects that make up the character of drawing as I've been able to define it within my painting practice. So tomorrow for Spanish Tuesdays, Martes Español, we will uh, explore another aspect of drawing. So we'll see how that goes tomorrow. So brush up on your Spanish. I always say it. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.